Um, it's a privilege to be here and I, I'm grateful to the Leiden Center for Health Humanities for inviting me to contribute to this really important conversation that they have begun uh, through their lecture series on aging. Um, this is a critical conversation and I'm really um, honored to be here. I'm going to go ahead and begin by sharing my screen. Can everyone see that? Yes, we can. Okay, terrific. So this presentation, as was mentioned already, addresses dignity in later life. And it draws on an approach and framework that is developed in my recently published book, Ending Midlife Bias, New Values for Old Age. The book covers a range of topics shown here and I focus on three today. Values across the lifespan, healthcare across the lifespan, and then I'll home in on values during later life. So today's presentation will ask three related questions, three questions related to those topics. First, what values matter most across the lifespan? Second, what values does bioethics apply across the lifespan? And I'll suggest a mismatch. I'll suggest that the values that matter most at each life stage are not always the ones that bioethicists tend to invoke and draw upon at those life stages. So I'll close with um, what values should bioethics apply at the end of life during old age. And I'll, I'll actually spend most of my time there. And I explore this question in some detail and I use some, a case to illustrate it, which I hope will spark a conversation with all of you. So let's begin with a broad sweep and ask what values matter most across the lifespan from birth to death? And one way to think about this is the following. We all age. This is not just something that happens to older people. It begins at the moment of birth. It's one of those human universals. We age. And as we age, ask yourselves this question. Do the values that you care about most deeply change or remain the same? So in other words, do values we cherish most as small children match those that matter most as we approach adulthood? Are the values that figure prominently during middle age, say, the same as those that take center stage in old age? And are there abiding values that we hold dear throughout our lives? Another way to ask these same kinds of questions is to ask the question this way. How do the values of youthful characters introduced at the beginning of a play change by the time the characters appear at the play's end? I think it's helpful to focus these broad concerns by distinguishing these more precise ones. First, do we emphasize different values at different life stages? Second, should we? So ought we emphasize different values at different life stages? And third, what specific values should we focus on at each life stage? So notice that the first question is empiric. And I cite some evidence throughout the book to suggest that the values we in fact focus on tend to differ at different life stages. However, this is not my central claim in the book or in today's talk. Instead, my main concern is the second question. It's an ethical question. Should we emphasize different values at different life stages? And I want to argue that we have good reason to do that. Since this is a general normative claim, it prompts a more pointed question, namely, what specific values should matter most to us at each life stage? And I'm going to spotlight one value, dignity, and one life stage, old age. And by doing that, I don't mean to suggest that this is the only value that matters or that there aren't other important values that we focus on in later life. But before we turn to later life, let's linger for a moment longer on the whole lifespan and the question, should we emphasize different values at different life stages? 
And in response, I'm going to propose what I call the life stage relativity of values. This is the claim that we ought to focus on different values at different stages of our lives. The highest value for a person relates to their life stage circumstances. Some important concerns are life stage features that reflect the shared human experience of aging. Thus, virtually all of us are tasked during infancy, infancy and early childhood with bonding to primary caregivers. Virtually all of us face the challenge during young adulthood and midlife of figuring out what we want to do with our lives. And virtually everyone is subject to threats to central functioning and capabilities during old age. So without filling in details, we can paint in broad strokes a picture of what life stage relative values might look like over a lifetime. If we imagine ourselves as small children, utterly dependent on others, the values that would matter most are being cared for and nurtured by someone we trust. Our condition of vulnerability and dependency would make these the right values for us. By young adulthood, the capacity to develop greater physical and emotional independence ought to lead us to place more emphasis on autonomy, especially, I think, in parts of the world that hold this value in high regard. While there are reasons for a focus on autonomy to persist during midlife, by later life, we face heightened risk for disease and disability. It therefore makes sense to shift our focus again this time to retaining capabilities and functioning or in the face of loss, keeping dignity intact. Admittedly, there are plenty of exceptions to the life stage relativity of values. For example, for a small child who's the victim of abuse, dignity and privacy might become central goods. For a middle-aged adult undergoing a divorce after a spouse betrays them, trust might become crucial. For an older adult with a terminal disease, autonomous decision-making about medical care might be hugely important. Still, I think that the life stage relativity, I'm sorry, life stage related values are apt to retain significance in these cases. For the child, nurturing care continues to matter. For the midlife adult, autonomously determining a new plan of life matters a lot, alongside being able to trust anew. In the case of the termini terminally ill senior, dignity is still essential. So I think that these examples attest that values like trust, autonomy, and dignity might rightly become focal at any life stage. However, this hardly defeats the more general suggestion I'm making that the primacy of a values often follows life stage predictable patterns. While core values like caring, autonomy, and dignity represent abiding concerns across the lifespan, we have reasons to focus on certain values more at certain stages because our situation warrants it. Now the life stage relativity of values might be unremarkable except for the fact that implicit life stage bias has crept into moral theorizing with implications for practice and policy. Life stage bias occurs when the ethical concerns and questions focal at one life stage are generalized and assumed to be central for all life stages. In the West, life stage bias often takes the form of privileging midlife. Midlife bias refers to a specific kind of life stage bias. It occurs when the ethical concerns and questions that matter most during midlife are generalized and assumed to be central for all life stages. Too often, I think, ethical analysis takes for granted the perspective of someone who is autonomous, chronologically relatively young, and in the midst of planning for a future adulthood that stretches out in front of them. This can lead to a focus on respect for autonomy and associated values of non-interference and self-determination, often to the exclusion of other values such as caring, trust, and dignity. 
To illustrate, consider the field of bioethics. I asked at the outset, what values do bioethicists apply to healthcare decisions for patients at different stages of life? And I, I now wanna to turn to address this question, the second question. And I begin with the observation that within bioethics, especially in North America and Western Europe, it is standard to stress capacities for rational agency and autonomy and to emphasize the special moral status accorded on this basis. In the words of Bruce Jennings, a political scientist and longtime contributor to the field, no single concept has been more important in the contemporary development of bioethics than the concept of autonomy, and none better reflects both the philosophical and the political currents shaping the field. How does Jennings' observation and my claim about midlife bias play out in healthcare decision-making across the lifespan? Let's start with pediatrics. Applied to pediatrics, a principle of autonomy, again, a midlife value, generates what I'd call a prep school model, which pictures children as future adults sees our job as delivering them safe and transforming children into adults. Drawing on the prep school model, pediatric decision-making often focuses on respecting a child's future autonomy. For example, discussing the care of critically ill infants in neonatal intensive care units, Seigal and colleagues recommend respecting infant autonomy by assigning preferences to the infant based on the preferences of adults who were previously low birth weight infants. An autonomy-based approach also um, is a common line of argument put forth by opponents of neo neonatal circumcision who argue that the child has a right to decide for himself and circumcision fails to respect the autonomy of the child, thereby violating this right. Another example is testing for adult onset conditions. Uh, this is Dina Davis' piece, which argues that respecting the child's right to an open future demands not testing minors for adult onset conditions. She's referring to Huntington's disease. And the reason is that they need to be able to choose as future adults whether or not they want this information. Davis also argues that parents who refuse cochlear implants for a deaf child act wrongly because they preclude the child from having the tools to leave deaf culture, thereby confining the future adult to a narrow group of people and a limited choice of careers, thereby constraining future autonomy. Now, if we fast forward from pediatrics to geriatrics, a principle of autonomy generates what I call a hang in there model which pictures later life as holding on, sees our job as helping the old stay young and privileges midlife values. For example, when making decisions for older adults with dementia who lose decision-making capacity, a hang in there model instructs surrogates to base decisions on an incapacitated patient's prior autonomous choices, thereby respecting autonomy long after it is gone. The hang in there model also lends support to the healthy aging movement, also promoted as successful, active, productive, and vital aging or aging well, which proposes that the old should do what they can to stay young and to attain good health by making the right lifestyle choices. Lastly, when allocating resources between young and old, a hang in there model instructs us to abide by principles that a rational chooser would adopt if they were ignorant of their age. Now in this analysis, the standpoint of young children and older adults with cognitive deficits is not directly um, represented. Um, it's represented only indirectly. Now we may or may not agree with these positions. I call attention not to the positions themselves, but the underlying rationale they share. I wanna argue that in each case, the justification appeals to respect for autonomous choice. 
So let's turn to the last question that I asked at the beginning, and this is the one I'm gonna focus most of my attention on. What values should bioethics apply to later life? And part of the reason I think that midlife bias is becoming more apparent now is that in some ways, at least, old age is new. Prior to 1800, no nation enjoyed an average life expectancy at birth beyond 40. Today, there is hardly a country that does not. Since 1900, more years have been added to the human lifespan than in all of history combined. Reducing childhood mortality and stretching the human lifespan has led for the first time to people in many parts of the world living well into their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Today, old designates people in their 80s. For the first time, large proportions of older people are beset with age-related chronic disease and disability. Since 1950, the expect, life expectancy at birth has risen by more than 10 years in Northern America, Europe, and Oceania, and by close to 25 years in Latin America and the Caribbean. In each of these four regions, life expectancy is projected to surpass 80 years in the coming decades. Again, this is the average life expectancy at birth. Asia has achieved the largest gain, so it has the steepest um, line here uh, in survival, adding nearly 30 years of life expectancy at birth since the early 1950s. Africa currently has relatively lower life expectancy, yet the continent is forecast to see further improvements and to surpass an average life expectancy at birth of 70 years by the late 2040s. So I think this is really remarkable. In an aging world, autonomy's significance may be waning because populations are increasingly geriatric, dependent, and vulnerable to cognitive and physical impairments. Historically, moral philosophers took for granted that one set of normative concerns was constant throughout life. That resulted in moral theories which life with life stage related values that went largely ignored and under theorized. As the 21st century advances, remaining relevant as societies everywhere age will require philosophers and others to give an account of the moral life that makes sense to people during later life. So what values can guide ethics for later life? I stress again that autonomy presupposes a capacity to make and carry out a plan of life. Yet this capacity is often life stage related. Older adults are at risk of losing this capacity. Young children have not yet developed it. While autonomy retains significance, other values I think can start to matter more in later life. I've suggested already that dignity is a core value during later life. And one reason it becomes central is that in old age, individuals are significantly more likely to face limitations that threaten central capabilities and functioning. For example, age remains the strongest risk factor for dementia. While dementia prevalence is very low at younger ages, it nearly doubles every five years of age after 65. Dementia affects, affected fewer than 3% of those aged 65 to 69, but almost 30% of people 85 to 89. Although early stage dementia may interfere only mildly with cognitive tasks, its final stages cause loss of memory, reasoning, speech, and other cognitive functions. Even when older individuals retain cognitive capacities, physical decline can pose obstacles to independently carrying out plans and preferences. The so-called diseases of old age, such as stroke, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and depression are chronic and often progressive. This graph shows the number of chronic conditions by age group. And it's really quite amazing to look at. The numbers rise sharply from about late middle age onward. So that by the time we reach age 65, over half of us experience two or more chronic conditions. 
And by 85, age 85, virtually all of us, 95% are affected. Over time, chronic conditions take a toll and tend to increase dependency, making it more difficult to perform activities of daily living without assistance. These include really basic tasks such as using the toilet, eating, dressing, and so forth. Chronic progressive disease also takes a toll on older people's ability to perform instrumental activities of daily living, such as grocery shopping, preparing meals, doing laundry. So while autonomy might be a central value, and maybe even the central value during certain life stages, and again, I'd qualify that by saying, especially in cultures where this value is highly prized, human life presents different normative challenges from birth to death. During later life, threats to central capabilities and functioning interfere with autonomous decisions and actions. Unfortunately, these threats to dignity have not received the attention they deserve, nor has the concept of dignity been applied directly to later life. To the contrary, dignity has gotten a bad rap. In a landmark article in the British Medical Journal, Ruth Macklin writes that, quote, dignity is a useless concept. It is redundant with autonomy and thus can be eliminated with any loss of content. A few years later, this is 2008, Steve Pinker wrote a paper in the New Republic entitled The Stupidity of Dignity, where he calls dignity, quote, a squishy subjective notion, hardly up to the heavyweight demands assigned to it. Since dignity has often been used without a clear understanding of what it means, I'm going to start with a definition. I'll spend some time on that, and then I'll circle back to the topic of later life and try to connect these conversations. Dignity comes from the Latin dignitas, and it refers to the quality of being worthy of honor or respect. We possess dignity, I think, because of the kinds of beings we are. So that leads to the question, what kinds of beings are we? What are the central things that human beings can do and be? What are our central human capabilities? I propose they include a list such as the following. First, life. And I understand life not in the purely biological sense. Instead, to be alive in the way that matters is to have a story, to have a narrative. So a, a story of one's life that's still unfolding. Health, being able to be healthy and well-nourished. Bodily integrity, being able to use one's body to realize one's desires and goals. For example, being able to move freely from place to place. Senses, imagination, and thought are a central human capability, right? Being able to engage in imagining, thinking, reasoning, and using our senses. Emotions are another central human capability. So being able to feel and express a range of human emotions. And by that, I mean feelings of sexuality, love, caring for others, as well as feelings like anger, fear, resentment. Practical reasoning is another central human capability, being able to reflect about and set goals for ourselves and engage in planning to realize them. Affiliation being able to live for and in relation to others. That's one of the central things that human beings can do and be. Nature, being able to live with concern for and in relation to animals and the world of nature. Play, I used to think this is just something my kids do, but it's really very important across the lifespan. So this is being able to laugh, to relax, to enjoy recreational activities, for example. And lastly, the environment, being able to exercise a measure of control, being able to somehow regulate the immediate physical environment we find ourselves in. So here again is the list of central human capabilities. And I think that as people move through the stages of their lives, their capacities to do and be change. A capability account of dignity reflects this and makes reasonable efforts to safeguard threshold capabilities at each phase or stage of life. 
So again, reasonable efforts, not unlimited efforts, reasonable efforts to safeguard thresholds to some minimal level of capabilities, each capability at each stage of life. And that's what respect for dignity, that's sort of my working definition of respect for dignity. And here I have it, a working definition of respecting dignity is making reasonable efforts to ensure individuals have each of these central capabilities at a floor level. So understood, respecting dignity demands that we support a variety of central human capacities, some of which, notice, are not directly concerned with autonomy, such as the ability to feel a range of human emotions, affiliate with others, relate to nature, so just go outside, play. A dignity-informed approach carries the distinct advantage, I think, of acknowledging a fuller picture of humanness, one that includes, yet is not limited to, the capability for rational thought and agency. So it includes um, practical reason, that's one of our central capabilities, but there are nine others. So what would a dignity-guided bioethics look like? Um, a dignity-guided bioethics. What exactly does it mean to make reasonable efforts to support threshold capabilities? I'd like to unpack that and try to operationalize it and translate it. I'm gonna do that by way of a case. This is the case of Annie. Annie was a 78-year-old woman who developed severe lumbar back pain and was unable to get out of bed for three days. On the fourth day, her pain improved enough to allow her to seek care. At Annie's appointment, she's diagnosed with a lumbar compression fracture, secondary to osteoporosis. But she's also diagnosed with a stage two pressure ulcer over the coccyx. She was instructed to minimize her time in bed, yet due to the pain, she's non-compliant. At a two-month follow-up, um, she has a large stage four sacral decubitus ulcer and a low-grade fever. She's admitted to the hospital, and an infected bone at the base of the spine was diagnosed. She received local wound care and was discharged to a skilled nursing uh, facility on long-term intravenous uh, antibiotics. So a dignity-guided ethical analysis of this case requires three steps. First, identify a paradigm that Annie's case falls under. Second, identify the capabilities at risk in the paradigm case. And third, formulate ethics guidance for patients who fall under the paradigm. So in selecting a paradigm that Annie's case falls under, I draw on what healthcare providers call geriatric syndromes. And geriatric syndromes represent a range of clinical conditions that occur with, um, with high prevalence among the elderly. They defy single, a single disease model. They often involve multiple organ systems and pathways. They're not amenable to standard practice guidelines, which rarely mention comorbidities or time needed to benefit in the context of life expectancy. And they're associated, unfortunately, with high morbidity and poor outcomes. Examples of geriatric syndromes include frailty, incontinence, falls, dementia, and pressure ulcers, which is, of course, the paradigm that um, applies to Annie, and that's the one I'll use to explore Annie's case. So then the next step is to ask what capabilities are at risk in the paradigm case? And I'm still talking at the general level of the paradigm of pressure ulcers, right? So I'm not talking yet about Annie. Um, the capabilities at risk in the paradigm case might include life, and remember that refers not to biological life, but to the life story, health, broadly understood, bodily integrity, so that's this ability to, to let's say, use one's body to carry out one's desires and goals, affiliating, and having some regulation of the immediate environment. These capabilities, these central human capabilities are at risk. And when I say they're at risk, I mean they're at risk of dipping below what we consider to be some threshold level. 
So what does that call for? What does respect for dignity call for in this type of case? Well, I think it calls for reasonable efforts to support these at-risk capabilities, and that's given under the ethics guidance. For example, reasonable efforts for to support Annie's life narrative, we need to know more about her, right, and her life story, what matters to her, what her goals are, um, who she affiliates, what her baseline is, but staying at the general level, reasonable support for Annie's life narrative might include supporting the activities and relationships Annie regards as central to the broader story of her life and which immobility and pain have undermined or put at serious risk. The focus is not here Annie in her role as a patient, but the, her life story. So that includes, of course, outside the hospital. Health. Protecting Annie's capability for health might mean setting goals, such as perhaps staying out of the hospital for 12 months, since hospitalization is associated with worsening of pressure ulcers. It might uh, require fairly intensive home care. Bodily integrity. Supporting bodily integrity might involve, for example, managing pain enough that Annie can have um, the, the capacity to leave the confines of her bed, right? So she, it's very painful for her. So supporting her ability for bodily integrity might need to address that in a reasonable way. Affiliation. People like Annie, people in this situation who have pressure ulcers and limited mobility can easily become socially isolated. And the same thing can happen with a lot of the other geri geriatric syndromes I mentioned, incontinence, for example, it can lead to social isolation and it can threaten the capacity for affiliation. Reasonable, so reasonable support for Annie's capacity to affiliate, affiliate might take the form of drawing on essential relationships in her life. But even if she has few relationships to draw on, promoting affiliation can occur in other ways, for example, by group activities she chooses to engage in, um, singing, games, or simply things like caregivers who connect, who convey caring through touch and voice. And lastly, environment. We promote Annie's threshold capacity to regulate her immediate environment by designing her surroundings in ways that maintain her comfort and functioning. And this might include a range of things. For example, a mattress overlay for her bed, um, a foam, um, wedge for when she's sleeping to put between her, her knees. Um, it might include a walker um, or other devices to assist with mobility, a wheelchair. So in the final analysis, I think, respecting Annie's dignity hinges on whether we make the effort to help her in all of these areas where her capabilities are at risk of falling below a threshold level. So some takeaways from the presentation. First, I emphasized the life stage relativity of values. I challenged the idea that values are unitary across the lifespan. And I propose that the values that matter most change as we move through the stages of our lives. Second, I made the claim of midlife bias. I argued that midlife, bias, midlife values, rather, like autonomy, tend to be overrepresented in moral philosophy and bioethics and to be considered more universal than they are. And lastly, while many older people are healthy and vigorous, old age increases dependency risk. And for this reason, the value of keeping dignity intact comes into sharper focus during later life. The aging of societies around the globe adds urgency to theorizing dignity and other values central to later life. I wanna thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nancy. Um, what a wonderful talk this was, very comprehensive. This tour around uh, bioethics uh, dealings with uh, dignity. So thank you very much. Now let, you, let me remind me just quickly, uh, I mean, you, the audience, I mean, um, how this works. So we'll now go into the Q&A, which means I 